Whiskey Uniform 2 Delta, WU2D. Again, again. Whiskey Uniform 2 Delta. Whiskey Uniform 2 Delta, good evening. Coffee November 0, X-ray Tango, Jack, in Minnesota. Tino, whether you got any power or fix it, off, down, whatever switch it's off. I understand that. So basically, when you cut it off, it always defaults to put whatever you got in port 4. You don't have to turn it to port four, it's on it. See that modern electronics they have different ports. Here we just have an antenna connector. This is the TR3. So if we take a, a general look at the TR3's condition, you can see the typical uh, oxidation and uh, pitting that's occurring on the uh, the copper plated steel chassis. It's uh, fairly rare to find one of these chassis in uh, pristine condition. Uh, this is not too bad though. You can still read all of the uh, the nomenclature on the chassis. So I think it'll clean up okay. I'm going to be removing the tubes one at a time and the crystals and uh, spraying the contacts lubricating the controls and all the normal things that you would do with any radio right out of the box that uh, is unknown. I'm uh, very much against uh, just applying power to these uh, radios blindly to see if they quote unquote work. <laughs> I just assume they don't work. That's the safest uh, way to go. So if we take a, a general look at the TR3's condition, you can see the typical uh, oxidation and uh, pitting that's occurring on the, uh, the copper plated steel chassis. It's uh, fairly rare to find one of these chassis in uh, pristine condition. Uh, this is not too bad though. You can still read all of the, uh, the nomenclature on the chassis. So I think it'll clean up okay. I'm going to be removing the tubes one at a time and the crystals and uh, spraying the contacts, lubricating the controls and all the normal things that you would do with any radio right out of the box that uh, is unknown. I'm uh, very much against uh, just applying power to these uh, radios blindly to see if they quote unquote work. I just assume they don't work. That's the safest uh, way to go. So the first order of business is to do an inspection. And I'm looking at the bottom of the radio. And I can see that the radio is in much better shape down below. So uh, the, the copper is almost perfect down here. That's a really good sign. And uh, you can easily see the uh, quality of the components of something overheated. Um, there are a bunch of paper caps in here, but uh, they look fairly easy to get to. Everything seems to be on little boards. The wiring uh, looks fairly straightforward. There's nothing too frightening in here, and the potentiometers won't be too e won't be too hard to uh, lubricate. And uh, got some jacks on the sides. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Let's take a look at the top a little closer. Now I looked at uh, this side over here, and it doesn't look too bad, actually. You know, it's got corrosion. You can see that there definitely was some moisture that came in. Uh, this thing might have been actually stored at an angle. You can see all the, the there's a pattern to the rust. When we turn it the other way, you can see that this side's a little worse shape. Got more corrosion going on over here. So I haven't touched anything yet. It's a very good sign that these uh, caps are 
in good condition and not tarnished or pitted, that tells you that uh, the finals might actually be good in this, that uh, they haven't taken a lot of abuse. Uh, the parasitic suppressors look in good shape. I don't see any zorching or arc over signs in the uh, high voltage uh, output cage. By the way, it is nice to have a cage uh, to both for RF reasons and for uh, high voltage reasons. Uh, we're going to go through this methodically and I have a tube tester that's a late model. Now the advantage of having a late model tube tester is it has the the proper uh, modern tube sockets for the era of the transceiver. See the finals will go right in here and uh, this is going to give me an advantage. Now when I actually looked up the 12 uh, JB6 tube um, it was listed, so I can I can test six JB sixes, but I can't test twelve JB sixes. Or can I? If I go to the twelve volt section of the manual course, it's not it's not listing the twelve JB sixes. So all we will do is try to figure out what the filament volt setting for twelve volts is. We know that for 6 volts it's apparently D. So what we would do is we would now go to a 12 volt tube and see what the setting is. Now my guess is E, but let's go. Okay, so we go to the 12 volt tubes, typical ones. I know that a 12 BF6, for instance, is just a single 12 volt tube. It's E. 12 BE6 E. Some of them are D. The dual tubes, like this 12 BH7, it says D because uh, that's a two section tube and they put the two sections in parallel with the center tap on the filament and you can run them on 6 volts. So uh, E is what we're going to set it for using the 6 uh, JB6 settings. We're going to put 12 JB6 tubes in and see what we get. Now if you have an older tube tester like my old Princeton it doesn't even have the socket to properly test the finals. In that case you have to make a socket adapter and uh, most people do that off the octal. There's an excellent article coincidentally in this month's July 2020 electric radio that shows you how to test these modern sweep tubes using nothing but an octal socket and the proper socket for the tube. You make a little adapter and you can figure out on the tester the right settings for the sweep tube. You just find a similar tube that's an octal and uh, use it as the settings. And you can really do some good work with tube types that are not listed on your tube tester by using that method. Okay, so you guys are going to go a little nuts, but uh, <laughs> in order to clean up the chassis and uh, make it somewhat stable, um, I decided that the, uh, the rusty spots need to be uh, covered with some type of lacquer. Now clear is what, uh, what you would want to use if you're doing restoration. I'm doing more of a stabilization, so I clean the area with some Murphy's oil soap and some cotton pads. Dried it with the uh, heat gun. Then I went in there with some very fine grit 600 wet sandpaper and sanded things down a little bit that I didn't like. And then uh, made sure everything was somewhat clean and I masked off some areas and went in there with metallic engine copper high temperature paint and just gave it a little spritz and uh, you know this stabilizes the you know this stabilizes the situation and uh, it doesn't look too bad you know so that's the approach that I'm taking on this Okay, so is it perfect? No. Is it better than it was? It certainly is. And uh, I think that this is a, a fairly uh, safe approach. As long as you mask off the areas and uh, remove any 
residual copper that might get splashed on things. You notice I took the tubes out and uh, covered the sockets with just some ordinary scotch tape. And they look pretty good. So the tubes are out of that section, so I'm going to test those tubes first. Then I'll put them back in after cleaning the sockets with some uh, contact cleaner. And then I'll move to the next section, and so on, until I've got the top chassis the way I want it. Well, I'm starting to test tubes, and I found that uh, a couple of the six EA8s are showing bad, either on the triode section or the pentode section. That doesn't mean the tubes are completely bad, but according to the tester, they have low gain. Uh, a good substitute for the 6EA8 is the 6GH8, which is a more popular tube. 6GH8 was used pretty heavily in TV sets. And uh, it's a preferred substitute, so there's no reason why you can't use it in the radio. Okay, so I've cleaned the contacts, I've replaced the tubes. I noticed that a couple of the tubes are missing tube shields. I found a couple old ones in the, in the junk box. Don't be afraid to replace the tube shields. That's what they're there for. So just a note about the 6GX6 tube. Uh, the 6GX6 is uh, used as a, uh, po a product detector and the carrier oscillator. Um, they don't do double duty with it and use it as the uh, as the modulator. There's a uh, diode ring modulator, but uh, 6GX6 is kind of an oddball tube, but it's completely equivalent uh, to the 6GY6. Uh, uh, so here's a 6GY6, and uh, these are uh, essentially equivalent tubes. It's... Uh, sharp cutoff pentode and uh, in a pinch you can use some other sharp cutoff pentodes uh, like a, uh, a 6HZ6 or maybe a 6CD6 those would work just as well uh, in that circuit so uh, there's some good substitutes but uh, uh, the X and the Y are, are completely equivalent and uh, don't think of that as a rare tube or anything. It's it's fairly uh, fairly common. So I've taken the first final, the 12JB6, out of the cage and I put it into the tester. Now it turns out that even this late model tester uh, does not list the 12JB6. It does, however, list the 6JB6. So all we have to really do is increase the filament to 12 volts. Right now it's set for 6 volts and I can see the tube is lightly lit and of course it's saying replace. That's because we haven't got enough emission out of the tube. So we know that E on this particular tester is for 12 volt tubes and I can, I can prove that by going into the 12 volt part of the book and you will see that um, the selector has to go to E. See the E's all down through here. So let's go to E. And that should light the tube up. And now you can see the needle going up on the meter. And it looks like we have a tube that has good emission. So it would be very lucky if all three of these tubes had good emission. And if under high voltage that they all uh, were going to give us output. Because the... 12 volt version of this tube is getting fairly expensive. Um, typically you're going to pay between 20 and 30 dollars each for these tubes. Whereas the normal sweep tube that's more popular you might pay half that. So these are getting a little bit pricey. And uh, we could talk about possibly substituting other tubes in for these or rewiring the filaments there's different ways to go if you uh, want to do the evil thing and uh, rewire the the set for different uh, tubes. And I've done that before. Um, I've converted uh, rigs that might take a couple of 12 DQ6s, for instance, and uh, rewired it 
instead of two 12D sixes, DQ sixes in uh, parallel to use two 6146s in series. They both equal 12 volts and I think some people like 6146s better. Of course you have to readjust the neutralization to accomplish such a thing but uh, if you uh, peek into a radio and it's supposed to have sweep tubes but you see a pair of 6146s somebody's done that kind of work before. So you guys also see I've got some tube substitution handbooks here. Some people feel that uh, tube testers are a useless accessory. As a matter of fact, in the operating manual for the uh, TR3, they say not to put a lot of trust in, in the tube tester, that it's much more reliable to do tube substitution in the radio to ascertain if a tube's bad. I'm not that pessimistic, and I've found that uh, tube testers are a great help uh, when you're uh, bringing a radio back from the dead. So, uh, kind of nice to have a couple different types from a couple different eras so you can cover all the types of tubes that you might encounter. Now this radio is using uh, tubes from the late 50s and early 60s, so you want to have tube manuals that are in that era. And I've got a couple here. This uh, Howard Sam's book, he dates from 1966. And this Tab Books 1972 edition. And I've got an old Allied manual that goes back even further. Between the three of these, we can figure out how to substitute a tube. When you are removing the Novar tubes, the finals, be very careful not to disturb the cap too much when you're taking it out. And uh, don't be bending these resistors back and forth or you'll break them. So you have to be careful when you're doing this work to make sure that you're not putting any more pressure on there than you need to. See how I just barely moved it out of the way. I don't want to cause any undue strain on that. It just lifted a little bit in order to get that tube out. Now these finals all appear to be uh, Sylvania's. They're beautiful, beautiful condition. So we might be lucky on these finals. Let's see if the second one comes up nice like the first one did. Again, we're using the 6 volt settings, but with a 12 volt filament. And uh, looks like this one's coming up good well as well. So even though this is a vintage transceiver, it looks like the finals have not been abused. And were obviously replaced at some point. And here's the final final coming up and it looks like it's a carbon copy. It could be that the uh, finals were replaced, but nobody uh, actually used the radio or tuned it up. So these could be fresh tubes. That's a very lucky find. Now the cage that the uh, tubes came out of, we'll go through and clean that. Make sure we get uh, any corrosion out of there. We'll inspect the uh, capacitors, make sure they're okay. There's a choke right on the output that needs to be checked for continuity. And uh, most importantly, in the very corner down here, we have a neutralization capacitor. We need to make sure that's clean before we neutralize the radio. And we're going to spend some time properly neutralizing this transceiver. This is something that's overlooked, ignored, and uh, you can get in real trouble if the transceiver is not properly neutralized. So we're going to learn how to do that. So here's the most important thing. Once you have those finals out, make sure you have them in a box where they're not going to hit the floor because you're going to have a bad day. And this is where you're most apt to make a mistake like that. So put them in a box and put them someplace where they're going to be safe.
until you get that cage cleaned out and you're ready to put them back in the radio. So where are we? We have now tested all of the tubes and we had one Actually, we had two tubes that had problems with uh, sections. One was a triode section, one was a pentode section. So we replaced two 6EA8 uh, pentode triode tubes. One of them was with another 6EA8, and one of them was with a 6GH8, which is an equivalent tube, a preferred substitute from our book. Now, in doing all this work, we uh, also tested some substitute used tubes and now we can put them away and call those spares. We'll just mark it TR3 spares and then we won't go hunting for for tubes. Uh, we'll have a little box that's got those spare tubes that are already pre-tested and ready to go for the radio. After removing the bezel off the back and the uh, the nice blue I'll tell you this, this uh, blue colorizer here seen better days but uh, that's the magic of the uh, blue dial face and uh, I'm looking down in there it's pretty pretty dirty and it looks like it's been uh, rebuilt possibly by hand there's uh, this Burghard Amateur Center in Watertown South Dakota maybe he's the one that rebuilt this uh, permeability tuned oscillator it's quite a interesting job, but yeah, it's definitely been resoldered and uh, and worked on. This is the BFO. Uh, I'm sorry. This is the VFO, the 6AU6, and uh, there's a a bunch of crystals under there that turn this into a heterodyne type uh, VFO. In cleaning all that, I got to thinking about that VFO tube, the 6AU6, just wandering around here. Boy, that. That's a tube I probably would have liked to have put some type of uh, cover on, you know. Something like this to uh, keep it stable. Um, maybe they had their ways, but I think I'm going to try to modify the socket so that we'll take some type of uh, spring cover. And we'll see uh, with and without what the effect is. But I have to figure out how to do that, so stand by. So you're saying, well, Mike, why are you modifying the radio? You haven't even tried to turn it on yet, and you're already modifying it. I'm just putting a tube socket in here that will allow me to put a tube shield on that will both stabilize the tube, and I'm talking about mechanically, and hopefully um, stabilize it to some extent uh, thermally. But that may or may not work out, but uh, let's see if I can do it without actually changing the socket. One thing they did very correctly was they put a ceramic socket in that spot. Every other socket in the radio is just simple phenolic. So they went to the trouble to put a ceramic socket in the VFO. Why didn't they go to the trouble of putting a full socket that uh, could take a tube shield? I don't know. So maybe I'm going to ruin it with this idea, but let's see if it works. Okay, so I have made myself a little tube shield holder base. I just popped it out of this old socket with my Cub Scout screwdriver. It literally took 20 seconds. It popped right out, and we're going to... Replace the hardware, which is a self-tapping type thing from the bottom. Very oddball way to mount tube sockets. I've never seen anything like it. We'll replace that with some number four hardware. And uh, that will secure that. And now we'll be able to put a, uh, a tube shield on there. So Okay, you guys are probably saying, Wow, Mike, that's, uh, that's out of control. Putting the... Uh, Putting the uh, base on there so you can put a, uh, a tube shield on the VFO. But you know what? It didn't take too long. I just slightly enlarged the holes so I could get the number four hardware through. And uh, this time we're going from top to bottom. And the nuts and lock washers are on the bottom. And 
Just an experiment. We'll see if the tube shield helps the VFO or hurts the So some of you are saying, Mike, you've been fooling with this thing for two or three days now. When are you actually going to apply power? And uh, the answer is not quite yet. There's at least four paper capacitors in the radio that I'd like to replace. And I think that uh, we should probably uh, put a cover over the cage back here. There is no metal cover on this other than the outer cabinet. So if you start to work on this radio and apply power, um, it's suggested that we put a piece of cardboard or, or perforated metal or something over that cage so we don't get our hands in there and get zapped. That's just for safety when we have the radio out of the case. So we're going to flip the radio over, do a good inspection, and uh, we'll replace those four paper capacitors. There's also an electrolytic capacitor, which you can see here. Um, I'll probably uh, cut the leads off the bottom of that, and uh, I'll put in a couple of uh, newer style electrolytics. But I'll keep it there for looks, and uh, then we will have uh, basically uh, changed the capacitors in the radio that are suspect. Then we will apply power. So on closer inspection, I count more than four. Here's one, two, and back of here, three, four, and a hey, over here, five. And then we have the, uh, the electrolytic capacitor. It's right here. So let's see if we can find some mylar or orange drop or some more modern capacitors that are tested and uh, we'll get those replaced. I like to check the capacitors that I take out. It's always nice to know if the capacitors actually were bad or not because we end up shotgunning out a lot of capacitors that turn out to be just fine. But uh, when you're only talking about four or five capacitors, I think it's worth doing it up front before you even apply So power. I mentioned that I'm going to change out uh, the paper capacitors that are in the Drake TR3. Uh, when you go ahead and change out a whole bunch of capacitors in a radio without checking them or with no regard to uh, whether they're good or bad, that's called shotgunning. And shotgunning these old radios is really not too bad because you have space to work and the parts are large and usually the parts that you're replacing them with are smaller. So there's usually room to, to replace parts. An example is uh, that large electrolytic capacitor on top is being replaced by a couple of smaller um, radio lead electrolytics that fit under the chassis. Here we have a paper capacitor that uh, is used as a coupling cap in a circuit. So I lifted one leg of the cap and I've got the other lead on the other side of the cap where it connects to the circuit and I've actually connected it to my capacitance tester. Now this capacitance tester is interesting because it not only can test the value of the capacitor to see if it's still, I believe this is a 0.47 microfarad cap used somewhere in the circuit, but it can also tell you if this 0.47 100 volt capacitor actually has any leakage. So I have it hooked up to the leakage setting right now. So. What we're going to do is we're going to engage the, the meter and start to increase the voltage. So right now I have it up to 300 volts. So I'm three times over the rating of the capacitor, which is 100 volts. As you can see, there is no leakage. So it's absolutely silly to replace that capacitor. That capacitor is just fine. So keep in mind that not all the capacitors that are in a radio of this age are going to be bad. Not to belabor the uh, capacitor situation, I've changed a few. Um, I've changed the power supply electrolytics. I've changed the two electrolytics on the cathodes of uh, tubes. You know, the, the audio output tube and the uh, Vox uh, had. Uh, some bypasses on the uh, cathodes. I replaced those with small electrolytics. But uh, these uh, paper caps all tested good. I'm just going to leave them alone. 
I did change out the automatic gain control cap because that's just good practice. You don't want any leakage there because you want good AGC action. So I think we're just about ready to do a final inspection and then we're going to light up the filaments and uh, maybe clean the switches and double check the, uh, the relay contacts. And then after we do the low voltage test and get everything working and clicking, uh, we're going to finally apply power to this thing with a variac and see if it comes up. Okay, in part two we're going to fire this thing up to see if we have any smoke coming out of it. And then we'll get right into the alignment of the uh, transceiver.